Welcome to all our delegates and thank you for joining us this evening. I'm very excited for this webinar to, tonight and I've been waiting weeks and the time has finally arrived. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Tanya Nell and sharing the screen with me tonight is our local endo legend, Dr. Hussain Sidat, that's been practicing in Durban, KwaZulu-Natal for more than 20 years and specializes in endodontics. Then a special welcome to our guest speaker tonight, Dr. Mark Habib from the famous Style Italiano group who has just come back from a very successful Endo Congress in Dubai. For amazing endodontic cases and information, please do follow the Style Italiano group on Facebook. It's very beneficial. So just to run through the proceedings for, proceedings for tonight, Dr. Sidat will introduce Dr. Habib, and during the lecture, Dr. Sidat will direct your questions um, for answering while he is doing his presentation. And a very nice twist for the evening is that after the lecture, Dr. Habib will ask the delegates three questions. So all answers need to be placed in the column question column. And there is three MG32 prizes up for grabs for the best answers. So your fate, ladies and gentlemen, is in these two men's hands tonight. Thereafter, I will share an amazing offer on the MG3 rotary file system, which is the launch offer. And then I would also like to take this opportunity to thank Dental Perfect, our partner, and especially Lisa Lynn, that made this webinar possible this evening. Enough from me now. I'm going to hand you over to Dr. Sidat to introduce Dr. Mark. Uh, thank you so much, Tanya, and uh, a very good evening to our audience in South Africa and warm greetings to our colleagues across the globe. It is my great privilege and honor to welcome an international endodontic icon to you, and I'm sure you are looking for, as forward to this as, as I am. Uh, Dr. Mark Habib has a very colorful CV which uh, I would like to, to run through with you before we uh, begin. Uh, Dr. Mark Habib was born in Beirut, Lebanon in the year 1979. He did his undergraduate studies in dentistry at the St. Joseph University of Beirut and graduated with honors. He was award awarded the Zara Ozonian Prize of Endodontics in 2004. Dr. Habib then did his postgraduate studies in endodontics and graduated in 2007 with a master's specialization in endodontics, followed by a master's in biomaterials of the oral cavity at the St. Joseph University as well. Since 2006 until now, he has been a clinical assistant teaching undergraduates at the endodontics department at the School of Dentistry at St. Joseph University. He is as well a senior lecturer giving courses in the Endodontic University Diploma Program at St. Joseph University, Beirut, and University of Jom uh, in Spain. He's also the treasurer of the Lebanese Society of Endodontology, member of the European Society of Endodontology, and member of the Style Italiano Society of Endodontics. Since 2009, he has been a member of the organizing committee for the annual international meeting of the Lebanese Society of Endodontology. He's a gold member of the Style Italiano Endodontics Group, a speaker at numerous conferences uh, and workshops in Lebanon and abroad. Dr. Habib is very skillful using the operating microscope and limits his practice to endodontics in his private practice at Beirut Endodontic Clinic. Dr. Habib will speak this evening on, on the principles of endodontic shaping and how we adapt these principles to more modern endodontic files. Uh, Dr. Habib, we look forward to you sharing your knowledge with us uh, and we wish you a warm welcome from all of us in South Africa and we hope to see you in person on our shores soon. Thank you, Dr. Habib. I'm, I'm going to now hand over to you for the presentation. Thank you, Dr. Sadat, for the introduction. I'm uh, really happy and flattered to be with you. Thank you for your kind words. Thank you, Tanya, for your uh, introduction and for your invitation, as well as for the perfect for uh, allowing this uh, great event to happen. Uh, I am sure that uh, Wright Milner's is uh, a leading uh, uh, organization to uh, education in South Africa. I am very happy to be here. I hope my lecture tonight will uh, will answer some question or will highlight a little bit the new uh, trends in uh, shaping and what we can have like new files and uh, uh, approach in shaping. 
So uh, shall I start? Yes, yes. You can share your screen. Voilà. We're okay. I can hear you. I can see you. Yes, oh. I can see the screen. So good, good evening, everyone. I'm very happy to be here uh, tonight. As uh, as I said, uh, tonight it's a lecture that is sponsored by Deep Perfect. So uh, it's the launch of an MG3 2. We know that I, I believe that you know as well the MG3. This is the launch of the MG3 2, so it's an upgrade. And as well, I'm going to talk about the TF4 at the end uh, briefly. So to talk about root canal shaping uh, and treatment, we know it's, we have a trifecta. So we are talking about uh, cleaning, shaping, and obturation. But I like to add as well the access cavity. So the access cavity for me, uh, for any endodontist who is working under microscope, so the access cavity is something very essential at the beginning and at the end of the treatment. And this is what we are going to see in my cases. So I'm going to see the access cavity at the beginning and at the end of each case. Uh, to talk about the shaping, this is uh, the famous Herbert Schilder. So he set, if you want, the rules, the objectives of uh, the shaping back in 1974. So uh, the, the principles, the target, the protocols, they are all the same. They didn't change. What is changing is the material. So uh, briefly, what are the targets that we want to have during the uh, root canal shaping? So we want to have a tapering from the orifice of the canal to the foramen. And basically, we don't want to have any transportation. So we don't want to, uh, to shift our trajectory of the canal. So we want the trajectory to, to remain the same uh, on the entire length of the canal. And we don't want, as well, a, a transportation of the foramen. So the foramen should not change of position and to keep it as small as practical. These are the principles that were set back in 1974. Today, we are still doing the same thing, but we are uh, evolving our instruments. Keeping this in mind, the, uh, the targets and the standards of uh, Herbert Schilder, uh, we know as well when uh, we are doing root canal treatment, the target for us is either to prevent a periapical lesion or to heal periapical lesion. So when we are doing these protocols, we are cleaning, shaping, and obturating, and following uh, Schilder's principle, as you can see in this case, we have a necrotic tissue, we have a necrotic uh, lateral incisor, we have a confit obturation, keep, keeping the, uh, the taper. We are keeping the uh, original trajectory of the canal, as you can see. And we are keeping the foramen as small as practical. We can get to our target, which is a, a healing. And uh, following this principle, Tore Benjad uh, stated that we have a very high success rate, which is about above 90% uh, of success rate. So uh, again, basically, this is our target to clean and shape and obturate in three dimensions. So we are going to go from the orifice to the apical part and clean, shape and obturate. And uh, the root canal system is not uh, just a tube. So it's a, a, a three dimensional system. As you can see here, we can uh, fill lateral canals. We have some anastomosis in the slower uh, first molar as well. We have uh, two facing lateral canals. So it's a system that you have to clean and shape. When you have, when you do a proper shaping and a proper taper, you can get your irrigant to the apical part and you can activate it then and try to clean as much as possible. Then you go to the obturation and you can uh, fill these accessory canals. Uh, in this lecture, I'm going to talk about these three uh, main parts of the uh, of the shaping. I like to talk a lot about the access cavity, and we are going to talk about the glide path and the, the crown down technique. So the access cavity, uh, I like to talk about it because there's a lot of talk uh, these uh, few years about the ultra conservative access cavity, which is the, uh, if you want the ninja access cavity that you find on social media. So this kind of access cavity, uh, I believe is, is unrealistic. We cannot clean and shape the entire root canal system through this access cavity. And you have the conservative and the traditional. When we are talking about that, we want to know why uh, some clinicians tend to talk about the ultra-conservative uh, uh, access cavity, which is the ninja access cavity. Uh, there is lots of research about the topic. Uh, to keep the access cavity a very small access cavity is to uh, maybe uh, get a more resistance to fracture. So we are, if you want, 
trying to preserve the tooth for to, uh, tooth fracture. But all the literature, we don't have a correct answer today. We don't have the scientifically based evidence that uh, a conservative, ultra conservative excess cavity will uh, diminish the fracture rate. Other clinicians and other uh, scientific articles were talking about this axis cavity as well. And the ultra conservative axis cavity, if it is, uh, a ca uh, what is the input of this axis cavity when you are talking about the cleaning inside the axis cavity? And they found in their studies, when these two uh, very interesting articles, that after the cleaning and shaping, they found uh, remnants of tissue inside uh, the obturation. So uh, a ultra conservative axis cavity, uh, in my opinion, is not. A recommended access cavity. Uh, to, to move to a selected access cavity, which would be either the conservative access cavity or the traditional. Me personally, I'm uh, still at the traditional access cavity. In some clinical cases where I know a lower molar, we have uh, one, uh, one root, one canal, I might go for a conservative access cavity. So uh, we like to call it as a dynamic access cavity, and we have to follow the walls of the uh, pulp chamber to locate our canals. So if you look at this case, here we are dealing with a lower molar with four separate roots, with four separate canals. You cannot uh, manage this case with an ultra conservative axis cavity. So this is typically about the axis cavity. I'm not going to go through it a lot. Uh, I'm going to move to the glide path. So the glide path uh, is, uh, as a definition cited by West in 2010, it's a smooth radicular tunnel from the orifice to the canal uh, terminus. So it's, if you want a pathway, a, 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 a patency from the orifice to the apical part of the canal. Uh, how usually we are uh, achieving that? So if you have a, a case where on the X-ray we cannot see the space of the canal, so here we are a little bit uh, worried or we have some concerns about the patency of the canal. If we cannot see it on the X-ray, that this doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. So have to work it out. Uh, usually we are using uh, hand files, uh, uh, stainless steel hand files, uh, 8, 10, and 15, to try to manage the patency and do the mechanic, uh, the manual glide pass. Once we have uh, the patency and we are we secured our uh, glide pass, we can shape, cone fit, and obturate the case at hand. So the, man uh, the manual glide pass done with the stainless steel files is difficult, time-consuming, with a very risk of canal transportation, will give us a less centered preparation. As well, when we are doing our uh, watch winding movements and our push-pull movements, we are extruding some debris to the periapical area, which will uh, eventually do some post-operative pain. This is why, in this case, this is an MG3 case. Uh, once we have the patency, the glide pad, this is a straight forward case. We have the working length, we have the comfort, and this is the obturation. So the glide pad is a very essential part of our a treatment, and this is uh, one of the uh, first part of the treatment. Uh, with the evolution of the uh, instruments of our shaping in 1988, when we had the introduction of nitinol, we know that uh, it was evolving the, the hand instrument, and we know that they are more flexible, and they, they will minimize lots of uh, uh, drawbacks of the stainless steel files. So we are talking in 1999 about the nickel titanium era, and here, at the beginning of the years 2000, we have a, a, an eruption of uh, uh, nickel titanium rotary files. And uh, we started our thinking about doing uh, a mechanical glide pass, which will, uh, if you want, uh, get our shaping part of the treatment, of the root canal treatment, faster. So the mechanical glide pass, as uh, cited um, many times by the great Cliff Ruddle, he had only to teach for the remaining time of his life the access cavity and the glide path management. So the mechanical glide path is easier, is faster, is a better respect of the anatomy, you have a, a better centered preparation that will minimize the extrusion of debris and this will lead to a, a, a less than a post-operative pain. So a mechanical glide path today is an essential part of the shaping. This is why many companies, including Perfect, introduced their glide pass file, the mechanical glide pass file, and we are going to talk about the PX, which is a continuous rotation uh, glide pass file, and the PX wave, which is a uh, reciprocating uh, glide pass file from the perfect. So what are the disadvantages of uh, nickel titanium? So we know they are uh, extremely uh, flexible. 
uh, but they had the tendency in high high uh, caliber uh, files to uh, uh, to tend to reposition to the original trajectory uh, and try to uh, do some errors during the shaping so uh, what was uh, the problem and how we were able to deal with this problem and how to evolve these nickel titanium files so this is a classic uh, first generation uh, night eye file so it's an austenite state file you can see it's stiff it's hard and it's super elastic so when you try to put some pressure on it it's going to uh, change shape it's super elastic but it will uh, come back to the original shape so when you, you are using such files and you have a big caliber so you have a big diameter for aiming and you are trying to get a big taper uh, it has tendency to uh, uh, alter the trajectory of the canal and will have less centered preparation this is why over the years we have uh, the heat treatment process this is a great review if uh, if you can get your hands on this paper it's a great uh, review about the thermomechanical treated night eye files in 2018 so the heat treatment file will uh, eliminate this disadvantage of nickel titanium file and uh, it will work mainly on the memory shape properties of nickel titanium so let us see this is an mg3 uh, file uh, it is an martensite uh, Martin state so you have you are tending to put some pressure on it and it's not taking back its uh, original shape 100 percent so it's a little bit uh, having some uh, memory control memory of the nickel titanium so uh, basically this is it when you are talking about an austenite night eye file it's going to after uh, putting a, a load on it is going to take back its original shape when you have a martensite night eye file it has a, a controlled memory effect so you are going to prevent it it's going to conserve its, uh, this prevent and uh, we are able to use it uh, in very uh, uh, it's very versatile when you are dealing with lots of cases especially molars when you are trying to shape a, a mesial canal on a second upper molar you can prevent the file and try to introduce it so depending on the heat treatment you can have a lot of uh, flexible files so this is a, another brand of files and you can see how it is very very flexible so depending on the nature of the heat treatment you can get a very uh, flexible files uh, even if you have a large taper so here you have a 30 tip uh, file and you have a large taper you can even create an s shape for this file so i'm pre-bending it just to show you how uh, the the memory it is a controlled memory shape so i can shape it as as uh, on room temperature uh, as i uh, find it fit so uh, this is the, the basically the the, the story uh, let me tell you just one thing more about the heat treatment. The, lots of companies are, uh, are uh, doing lots of heat treatment, but we have to find an equilibrium between the heat treatment and the cutting efficiency because uh, we have lots of points to talk about during the heat treatment. So if it's very well heat treated and very flexible, it might not cut. The advantage of that, it is uh, very resistant to cyclic fatigue, but it might not cut and it will not uh, fracture maybe it will unwind but it will not cut as well so we have to find the uh, right equilibrium between the heat treatment and the cutting efficiency talking about the last point uh, in the shaping is of course the the uh, the coronal interference when we talk about the coronal interference we know that we are talking about the step down and the crown down technique all the nickel titanium files that are on the market are based on this concept of removing the coronal interference before shaping the apical part so uh, uh, back in 1999, this is a, a great article of uh, Cliff Ruddle, also is talking about early coronal enlargement. And uh, the title here is Current Concept for Prepare Preparing the Root Canal System. Nowadays, we are still there. We are in the still, still uh, mind, still st the same thinking about removing our coronal interference before uh, introducing our files in the apical part, in the middle third and the apical third, and trying to negotiate these uh, 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 curvature, this S curvature, this extreme hard curvatures. So removing the uh, triangle dentine at the beginning of the root canal is uh, really uh, important. Uh, this case is typically the opposite. So here we have straight canals. We are not obliged to remove uh, as much as we need. So we have straightforward canals. We are not going to change anything here if we are going to use them or not. 
but when we are talking about uh, extreme curvatures, in this case, I like to put this case because in the same mesiobuckle route, I have a, a extreme a continuous curvature and I have an S-shaped curvature in the same route. So in these cases, you cannot manage them without removing this uh, coronal triangle. This Removing the coronal uh, interference will help us in the uh, getting the accurate working length because we are if we are working without removing this the dentinal triangle at the beginning we might have uh, a change in the working length and this will create lots, lots of problem in the apical part during the shaping we have a preservation of the anatomy and the transportation and the heat treated files will help us a lot in remaining uh, uh, in the correct position in the in the canal so we have a centered shaping we have more space and time for the elegance we know with the shaping with the mechanical shaping nowadays we, are, we have tendency to do it in a very quick way so we have less time for the irrigant so when you are removing your coronal interference and you are putting sodium hypochlorite immediately so you are giving more time to the irrigation solution to do its work during the shaping procedure and we have as well less debris it is uh, proven during the uh, crown down technique using a nickel titanium file that you have less debris and this as well uh, during the, all the shaping with the mechanical uh, files so mgt when what it was launched we we had this uh, introduction we have uh, the uh, orifice uh, opener here they have the coronal third um, file which is a starter which was a 20 tip and 10 percent uh, taper so we have a big file at the beginning of the shaping to remove this coronal interference we have a straight line axis so we can manage our apical third so when we have a curvature at the beginning and a curvature at the apical part and maybe an s shape in the apical part it is very uh, risky to enter your file without removing your coronal triangle so here we have two glide pass file p1 and p2 then we have shaping file g1 g2 and g3 what I like about PERFECT is these cards because uh, what I look today uh, in nickel titanium file when I get a new sample and I have to try it is the basically I'm going to look about the heat treatment, the glide path file and the cross section. The cross section is a very important part nowadays about uh, any kind of shaping file. So uh, when you have a heat treatment file, you are doing a, a very high heat treatment file. If you are going to use a square cross section, it was not going to cut. Maybe you will have to choose a, a, a more uh, aggressive uh, cross section, maybe a triangle or an S shape uh, cross section to get the file to cut more. So you, you are uh, enhancing the flexibility, but you need as well the cutting efficiency. So these are cards are very interesting and perfect, has lots of files. Uh, you may go, you may go uh, get lost in the cards. So these cards will help you a lot to have all the specs about all the files in the kit. So this is the first case I want to share with you. Uh, each case I'm going to share with you is, uh, other than the shaping, you have some extra in the case. So, uh, of course, the axis cavity at the beginning, under magnification. In this case, it was a crack tooth syndrome. So the patient had sensitivity on the tooth for a certain period of time. Then it went for a pulpitis. And in fact, it was after the axis cavity, I, I put some uh, um, metal in blue on the distal wall and uh, after uh, painting it and drying it I was able to locate on the under microscope uh, the uh, crack line so this is the crack line on the distal wall of the axis cavity so this is uh, a big disadvantage for the tooth but it is a treatable tooth so here I'm not going to extract the tooth since the crack line is not spreading on the pulp chamber floor and it's not spanning on the other uh, mesial wall, so it is still uh, in the distal wall. Here, the indication is to do the shaping, the obturation, and of course, to do a full coverage for the distal. So here, I'm using the starter. I'm going to uh, a little bit speed it up because it's a little bit long. So I'm going to use the starter. Then uh, after the starter, this is the MG3 G1, 24%. Uh, if I uh, feel that I, I need to use my light pass file, I'm going to use it. Here, I didn't put it in the video. What we have to look here is at the at the flutes of the file. You can see they are filled with dentin. So we know that the file is cutting. When the file is cutting, we can uh, continue using this file. When it's not cutting, we, uh, we either have to choose a bigger file or the shaping is done. So this is the, uh, the final case, four canals, 
And of course, after the shaping and the build up, we went for a full coverage for this tool to ensure a longevity of the case. So this is basically the MG3. And another case with the MG3, so uh, this is a, another molar from the other side, tooth number 36. Patient had a, a slight recession with a history of sensitivity. Uh, and the patient uh, at the end uh, came for a root canal treatment because she couldn't hold the, the sensitivity at all. Here I'm using the MG3 starter again, 20-10% taper, to start with the coronal part of the canals. You can see here the mesial canal, they are uh, flared, they are pre-flared already. When you are using this kind of files, uh, this is the MG3 P1, then the P2, 16-2% and 19-2%. I was talking about the, the the coronal interference file, so this is the starter. Uh, we said we are going to use it at the entry of the canal. When you are going to do this file and you are going to select a brushing wall, you are going always to use it on the walls that are going to name the canal. So if you are working on the mesial buccal canal, you are going to brush on the mesial and the buccal uh, walls of the canal. So here again, I'm using the shapers. This is G1, 24% on the mesial, mesiolingual canal, or this is the mesiobuccal canal. So once uh, I shape it and uh, I feel that I need to go to a higher taper, I can go. If not, I can uh, remain on it. Basically, we are finishing our shaping at 6% taper. So we have the option of 25, 6% taper. Uh, to finalize uh, the cases. So this is the, the final result of this case. MG3 uh, upgraded to MG32. Uh, basically, we, have, we still have the same uh, opener. So it's a, a 20, 10% uh, opener, the SV. Then the glide pass file, instead of having two glide pass files, P1 and P2, which are 16.2% and 19.2%, they merge them with PX. PX is a 15, 3% taper. So it's going to do, if you want, the work of both files in one a single file, which is uh, more handy and uh, more uh, practical for the clinician. Then we have the G1, G2, and G2 as well. 25% uh, for the first G2 with two uh, stripes. And the G2 with three stripes is a 6% taper. So here you, you cannot get lost. It is a glide pass file with three finishing files, two at 4% taper and one at 6% taper. And this is, uh, again, the cards, which are very handy, cross-section. And as well, uh, you can see the, uh, the recommended torque, the taper, 3% for 6% and the available working length. You have it at 21, 25 and 31 millimeters for canines. I wanted to show you this new system on a resin block before moving to a couple of clinical cases. So here I'm using the D-Perfect motor, which is a very uh, interesting motor. It has uh, preset uh, systems, continuous rotation and reciprocation rotation. So on a resin block here, well, the first thing to do is to uh, measure the working length. It is a replica of the two, so this is a simulator. So first of all, we are going to put some EDTA gel to scout the canal, see if it's patent or not, measure the exact working length. Once I have the exact working length, I can choose here. If the canal is narrow, I can use the glide pass file at the beginning to create some space for the tip of the opener, which is the SV. So the SV is 20. 10%. If I feel that it is very large at the beginning to enter this canal, I can use the glide pass file at the beginning before using it. You can see I'm measuring the, the part which is going to work inside the canal. I'm not going to introduce it more. I'm just introducing it to the part where it's the active part of the file. So it's a very short file. I'm only working the uh, coronal third. I'm not going deeper. I don't want to go deeper. I don't need to go deeper. This is the target of this file. Of course, between each file and file, I'm going to irrigate, recapitulate, and uh, check my patency. This is the G1, 24%, to the full working length. I did already the glide path. I did the coronal enlargement. And I'm moving to the G2, 25, 4%. So here, I'm going uh, slowly to the uh, working length. When I reach the working length, I do some strokes on the, uh, some brushing on the external 
walls against the curvature. Here again, I'm, I chose to uh, higher the taper, 25, 6%. You can see now the, how much it's generating debris. You can see the, the canal is blocked. It's filled with white resin powder, which is uh, indication of the cutting efficiency of this file. Now to the full working length. So I stopped at the middle. I recapitulated, I irrigated, and now I went to the full uh, working length of this canal. You can see it's filled with uh, white powder. This is the part of the resin that was shaped. And at the end, I'm going to rotate my resin block just to show you uh, the efficiency of the shaping on all angles of this resin block. So it's completely safe, uh, very efficient, as you saw in this video. So now we showed you on the uh, resin block. Let us uh, move to a clinical case. An upper second molar. Uh, and we had an implant before it with a big crown, so it was a little bit uh, uh, messy to get to the access cavity. Here it was, it was built up with a big uh, indirect restoration, and the patient was always sensitive uh, to cold. It so had some episodes, so it was uh, the beginning of uh, uh, pulpitis, and she was a traveler. She told me, Mark, listen, I have to do this root canal. I cannot travel. It's hurting me a lot. So this is what we did. Uh, at the beginning, again, access cavity here. Uh, I noticed at the beginning of this case that my uh, MB canal was a little bit large. So it, there was a little bit, uh, a big part of tissue in this mesiobuckle canal. So I'm going to keep it till the end. I'm going to uh, pre-flare with the SD 20, 10%. I'm pre-flaring my palatal canal. I am pre you see, there's nothing that entered in this canal. It's still very narrow. I'm using the SD just to brush on the outer walls the distal wall and the buckle wall. Distal buckle canal, distal wall, buckle canal, uh, buckle wall. So I'm uh, brushing and creating, removing my uh, in the coronal interference. Here in the mesial buckle canal, I'm doing the same, working on the mesial wall and on the uh, buckle wall. After that, I take my PX, 15, 3%, reach the entire working length and secure my patency. You can see we don't have any more coronal interference. The file is reaching the working length. I'm securing my uh, glide path. Again, on the mesobuckle canal. I like to work the three canals with the same instrument. Then I switch instrument. I'm not going to use three files on the same canal. Then again, the three other files. So it's uh, economy of time while, you are one, uh, while we are shaping these canals. OK, uh, G1, 24% as well palatal canal, distal canal, then I go to the mesiobuckle canal. G2, 25, 6%, the palatal was already sufficiently large, so I go straight to the G2, 25 and 6% taper. Distal canal as well. This is a long video, I think. So here, uh, I am drying after shaping my three canals. I am drying, and I can see that in the mesiobuckle canal, uh, the shape of the canal is not 100% uh, one canal. So I had doubts of having an MB2 canal. So here, I was uh, searching for my MB2 canal. I uh, have a file holder. I'm using it, and I'm scratching the isthmus of this uh, mesiobuckle canal, and I'm looking for uh, my extra canal. Here I'm doing a troughing for the MB2 canal. I'm looking for it. I'm using ultrasonics on this isthmus. I can see it. I can see there's an isthmus, but I can't find any canal. So I'm doing my uh, troughing for the MB2, and I uh, can't find any MB2 canal. So at a certain phase here, I'm going to uh, stop, and uh, that's it. There's no MB2 canal. We are not going to over-treat our case. And uh, this is the aspect after the, uh, the troughing, this is the confit, and this is the final obturation. This is the final result. So uh, we don't have an MB2. I looked for it. Uh, it wasn't there. Another case, this is now a lower molar. Uh, the first molar was treated, and now there's the second molar. So the first thing as well here, after uh, doing the access cavity, I have to examine my access cavity and look if there's something uh, 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 to find or not, an extra canal or not. 
So here I located my orifices, the entry of each canal. You can see this is an inflamed pulp. SV20, 10% as well. We are going to uh, pre-flare the entry of each canal. Once I do my distal canal, I do my mesiobuccal canal, and then I go for my mesiolingual canal. So uh, here as well, I'm going to use my uh, SV to pre-flare uh, always on the uh, walls that are naming the, uh, the, the canal. Mesiobuccal, MB, and mesiolingual. After the working length, I go for my glide path file, the uh, mechanical glide path file, the PX 15.3%. The three canals, you can see the mesial canals are a little bit narrow, so they are taking time. I'm taking my time, I'm irrigating, I'm uh, recapitulating each time, I'm not forcing the file to get to the working length immediately. After that, there's lots of room for my G1, which is a 24% after the glide pass file, then I go to my G2. I'm going to use my G2 uh, in the distal canal. I can see it, it's very loose, so I'm going to switch to the mesial canals, the mesiobuccal and the mesiolingual canal. Once I have that, I am going to take the G2 25-6% for the distal canal, because at the beginning, the G G2 4% was loose. You can see the debris on the file, so uh, the file is engaged in the distal canal, so it's cutting. So I can uh, continue with it. And if I decide to continue on the mesial canals, I can do as well. So now we did the troughing on the maxillary molar. Now I'm doing the troughing on the lower molar. Between ML and MB, I'm searching for which canal? For the middle mesial canal. So always when I'm uh, doing a, a lower molar, uh, I am troughing uh, this, the isthmus between these two canals and looking for a, an extra canal here as well. Unfortunately, uh, we didn't find any uh, middle mesial canal. So this is the axis cavity after the drying. This is immediately before the obturation. I'm doing a final check of the axis cavity before entering my uh, cone, uh, uh, master cones with sealer and doing my obturation. I'm using a warm vertical compaction. And this is the, uh, the final uh, view and the final X-ray for the obturation. So you can see the system is very efficient in all uh, kinds of situations. Uh, what, we, what we need to know, as I told you before, for each system, we have to know the, 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 the file. Uh, this is the, uh, the chart for the TF4 reciprocating system. Uh, we have to know what is the cross-section of the file, what is the material. OK, we know it's a nickel-titanium file, but we, know, we need to know at least an idea about the heat treatment file. If there's nothing on the box, we can only open the box and we can twist the file and we can know if it's a Mertensite file or if it's an Austenite file. At least we can have an idea about it. Uh, the cutting blade, uh, the number of flutes, if they have spaced flute or not. The tip, if it's an active tip or if it's a non-cutting tip. Of course, we have to examine the handle of the file if we have rings indicating the taper and the color, of course, is standard color, the red for 25 and the blue for 30 and uh, the yellow for 20. So this is the F4. This is a uh, four file system with uh, reciprocating motion. It's a square uh, cross section uh, and it's uh, reciprocating. We have 27 percent, 25, 7 percent, 35, 6 and 45, uh, uh, 05 percent. So uh, I showed you lots of cases of uh, primary treatment. So we had a vital uh, or necrotic tissue. So for the TF4, I decided to show you a, a retreatment case. Uh, this is the case. Uh, so uh, a colleague referred this case uh, to the office and he told me, Mark, listen, there's an old uh, amalgam with a, lots of decay below it and uh, we have a lesion on the distal canal. What we can examine, as we always say, and I say always to my student, uh, endodontics, when you have to uh, retreat a case, the or do a primary treatment, the preliminary x-ray is uh, very important. And what we can see here is that on the distal, uh, the distal route, we can see uh, a main canal and we have some spreading of material on the distal aspect of this uh, route. So this is what I suspected at the beginning. We might have uh, maybe a lateral canal or a second distal canal. So here, uh, 
for the retreatment, you have many clinicians that are using solvent, others that are not using solvent. This is the, uh, the situation of the access cavity. So we had lots of decay. We have old filling material. Uh, I like to use solvent almost always. Uh, only if I take a file and I put it inside the canal and it reaches the, the entire working length. So I, I know that the, the leakage is did the work of the solvent, in fact, so I'm not going to put any solvent. So here I'm using a specific uh, pipette that is going uh, to put very accurately my solvent at the end of each canal. You can see it's a very accurate uh, pipette that I like to use. And here I'm using uh, the SV, the 20, 10% paper for a retreatment. And it is really efficient. Uh, if the uh, rubber is already uh, liquefied a little bit, you can see the cutting efficiency. You can see the, the liquefied gutta perca on the on the SV file. So I'm removing and I'm pre flaring at the same time. I have to remove as much as possible uh, the entire coronal part of the old filling material before negotiating the apical part to prevent any protrusion of my uh, liquefied gutta perca uh, from the canal. At a certain phase, in the middle third, I'm going to stop putting uh, solvent, of course. Uh, and we are going to manage the applicate third without any solvent. This is the T5, T25, 7%. So here I'm giving a 7% paper with a 25 tip, which is uh, basically a very good uh, combination. This is the access cavity after cleaning the decay and doing the shaping. This is the distal canal. You can see we have a very deep split in the distal uh, canal. So we have a main canal, uh, eight-shaped canal, and at the bottom you can see under magnification here, I'm uh, doing a 16 times magnification. You can see you have two spots. These are the two spots of my split canals, and I managed to position two comfort separately, and uh, uh, the tricky part in doing these cases is to be able to manage the obturation of two canals in one route with a deep split. And this is the final result, a very decent uh, uh, case uh, before, during, and post-op using the TF4 system from the perfect. I think that's uh, all the cases I had for tonight. Uh, I hope you like them and uh, it would be great to have uh, the question from the audience. Well, thank you so much, Mark. Thanks for that amazing presentation. Um, the audience is very quiet tonight. There's no <laughs> questions. Any questions? Hmm. Yeah. Voila. Okay. Dr. Mark, you want to ask your three questions? Uh, yes, of course. Uh, they are not loaded yet, uh, Tanya. Okay. If you want, I, I have them with me. I will, I'm going to read them from here. I, That's perfect. Okay. So uh, the first question is the glide path. Uh, I need the definition and what is needed for during the shaping procedure. So the glide path. This is the first question. Okay. Question also on the question column. We'll give the delegates a minute or two. So, Mark, what, what, what I was I was waiting for you to interrupt me. You didn't interrupt me. <laughs> no, I was waiting for questions. <laughs> oh, okay. What solvent did you use? Uh, I I am uh, using xylol. Okay. Do you know what? Yes. Uh, yeah, this is the uh, this is the if you want the universal uh, solvent, it liquefies everything. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, for resin and for uh, gutta perca. So instead of selecting uh, a solvent each time, so I'm using it, uh, regardless of the nature of the paste. Doctor, see that you've got some answers there already. Yeah. Uh, okay, uh, Doctor Bhagwan's got a question. He asks, uh, "Do you use the orifice opener before ach achieving working length?" Yes, of course. Um, the target 
of using the orifice opener the, to remove the, the, the triangle of dentine at the orifice entry is in fact to remove the first curvature. When you are going to remove the first curvature, you are going to change the working length. So if you take the working length at the beginning and you use your K-file number 10 and you have like 21 millimeter, after removing the, the dentinal triangle at the beginning, you are going to have a reduced working length, which is, for instance, 19.5. So you might lose one millimeter. So of course I'm going to uh, remove, then I'm going to take the working length. Definitely. Okay. Of course it depends from each case to case. If, uh, as I showed you the premolar where you have straight canals, you don't need to change the working length. It's going to be the same because it's straight line. And uh, Dr. Makanji has answered uh, your first question. Uh, to obtain easy access to uh, of the of the canal system from the crown to the apex. Okay. Okay, this is the uh, part of the part of the answer. Is the correct answer or this part of the answer? Uh, and uh, we have another question. Do you use yeah. both the red red files in every case? The twenty four. Uh, I assume it's the 2504 and the 2506. Yeah, this is this is a great question. I, I showed you some cases where I, I switch immediately to the 2506. So uh, each case is different than the other. Uh, and of course, the clinician had to do his judgment during the shaping phase. So uh, if in the distal canal, we find that it's a very large canal at the beginning to start with, it's a large canal. So I'm not going to use even the 24% or the 20 Four percent. We are going immediately to go to the twenty-five, six percent. So uh, the cards are not uh, uh, obliged to follow them by the book. We can select each file for each other, and we can mix uh, the system as well. This is what I do uh, a lots of time. But MG three two is uh, basically uh, a kit that you can use in all cases. It is done for that. So. Uh, uh, you can mix and you can select to use one of the files. This is what I did. Uh, thank you for this question. Dr. Sidat, under your chat column, there's two answers there for the cloud. Okay, okay so uh, Dr. Guda says uh, it's a smooth radicular tunnel from the canal orifice to the canal apex. 100%. Uh, and uh, Dr. Clearance uh, says uh, it's the creation of a smooth round canal to the apex needed to provide smooth prep for working files. So I think, I think the, the render is the, the most correct answer because uh, the glide path is the, he had the correct definition. And uh, basically this is what we need for the, uh, for the shaping. We need a, a smooth space to introduce our bigger files without any risk on the tip. This is the answer, basically, Tanya. Okay. So we don't want any risk on the tip of the shaping files. So um, I think okay, so uh, Randall can be, can be our winner for... Uh, so Dr. Kleinans will be our winner. Okay. We're gonna, there's some other questions on the question chat, and then Celeste will load the next question for us as well. Okay, so Dr. Bhagwan would like to know if you prefer rotary versus reciprocation. Yeah, this is the this is the typical question. Thank you, Dr. Vimal. This is a typical question. Uh, I have the the answer always ready for that. So uh, usually I prefer uh, continuous rotation. I like a lot the continuous rotation because I can control more the cutting efficiency. You can feel it with the motor when you are doing a continuous rotation. Uh, nevertheless, the reciprocation motion is indicated in so many cases that you cannot uh, neglect. So, uh, in S-shaped canals, when you are doing S-shaped canals, I'm definitely going to use a, a reciprocating motion, especially for the glide path. Uh, uh, in the maybe the extreme curvatures, extreme curvatures, uh, when we are, we want uh, to make a a larger taper, we need to do more taper, we need to do more taper. So in uh, large files with more taper needed, it is better to use a reciprocation file. Uh, it is more safer for the preparation. 
uh, and that will give us uh, less transportation, even with the heat-rated funds. So uh, reciprocation, uh, S-shaped canal, continuous uh, curved canals with large tapers, I'm going to use reciprocation. Other than that, if you want a percentage, I can give you 60, 40 percent, 60 continuous, 40 reciprocation. Uh, this is me, but uh, you have lots of clinicians are using all the time uh, reciprocation. Uh, Dr. Kiran Ramson would like to know uh, what type of obturation do you use? Uh, do you use thermal compaction or? Uh... Yeah, uh, yeah. Th thank you for the question. I didn't show lots of obturation because uh, I wanted to focus more on the shaping. Uh, maybe in another lecture we'll focus on the obturation. Uh, basically, I'm using the warm vertical compaction. So I'm using uh, like uh, a system B or a touch and heat with multiple heat waves. Uh, I'm not using, uh, if the question is, uh, I'm not using any bioceramic case, uh, sealer. I'm using zinc oxide sealer with warm vertical compaction. Yeah, this is why the radiolucency is very consistent because I am mixing the sealer, so not the assistant. So this is the, basically a, a number one rule. I am always mixing the sealer. I am not allowing the, the assisting uh, mixing the sealer, so I always do the sealer depending on the case. So there is no one mixing of sealer for all the cases. So when you have a S-shaped canal, you are not going to mix the sealer as if you have a, a central incisor with a foramen of 45. So the sealer consistency will change, and uh, I do it uh, according to the uh, master comp. So, uh, uh, I have a very controlled uh, obturation technique with the sealer, basically. This, the sealer is the key. This is the tip of today. Mm. <laughs> <It's yourself. laughs> Dr. Mock, you want to ask the next question? Sure. Uh, uh, what will the heat treatment modify in the properties of the nickel titanium file? So this is a, this is the question of today. Uh, so all the clinicians are using the heat treatment files. And we have been using them now for a, more than ten years. Heat treatment file started with the R phase and the M wire, and we are now with the gold and blue and heat treated files. So uh, why are we using them? Why we, did we switch to the uh, heat treated files? For which purpose? Which advantage on the properties for the nickel titanium? Okay, so Dr. Kalina van der Linden says the cutting efficiency of the file, uh, but I think uh, she's expanding on that. And the advantage is flexibility, she says, increased flexibility. You are going to select the, the, the winner this time, Dr. Sadat. <laughs> It's your turn. Okay. I didn't uh, get the correct answer yet, honestly. And then there's one in the questions again. The delegates are keeping us busy between chat question, chat question. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so Dr. Makanji says uh, it's uh, to change it from an austenitic to a martensitic uh, uh, phase. So, uh, I'm happy with that. That's what the, well, that's what the heat treatment does. Uh, uh, but I liked what you said also, uh, as far as the, the the amount of heat treatment and how it affects the cutting efficiency. Um, so so what you're saying is that the the, the more it's heat treated, uh, the the less the the cutting efficiency of the instrument. Yeah, I I I, I read it so many places and I I. I uh, tried them firsthand, uh, Doctor Sadat. So I had uh, I, I almost worked for all the all the shaping uh, companies almost. So uh, <coughs> uh, you have uh, lots of heat treatment. The, the, honestly, the file will not cut anymore. The file will not cut. I tried uh, clinical cases with file that that don't cut because they are extremely heat treated. So today, all the companies knows that that uh, there's a middle ground. You cannot uh, heat treat a lot, and uh, uh, you need to heat treat. So you have to find the middle ground 
So the file will not break, so I, uh, I'm not going to answer the question because I need the correct answer. I'm still waiting for the question. Yes. There's <laughs> more on the chat. You are bringing me to answer. Dr. Sijat, uh, on the chat, uh, Dr. Loki says it will increase the flexibility as well as the resistance to cyclic fatigue. And then Sterley says heat treatment will make the file more flexible and less chance to flat fracture and gives it a more bendable memory. We've lost Dr. that. <laughs> I don't know if he's got uh, he, he, he is going to uh, <laughs> choose the winner. So you can choose the winner. Heat treatment will make the file more flexible and less chance for fracture and give it more of bendable memory. It will increase the flexibility as well. The reasons. Okay, the, 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 the thing about the cyclic fatigue is completely correct. So uh, heat treatment will maybe increase the resistance to cyclic fatigue up to 20, 30 percent, 30 times more. So it's extremely uh, increasing the resistance to cyclic fatigue. Uh, of course, the, the other thing is the uh, controlled memory. Uh, shape. So uh, I think maybe Linda, uh, Linden will uh, will has the more correct answer. I don't know, Doctor Sadat. You can see the answer with sorry, the. Sorry, I lost. Don't yes, worry. Yes, yes. I can. Uh, Doctor um, Okay. So are there any more answers? Okay. So Doctor Mark so, was looking uh, at Doctor Loki. Okay. Right. And then we also uh, on questions. We can get two winners for this question or not, Tanya? Yeah, so uh, I can give two people. Okay, we, we, we Dr. Lucky and uh, Dr. Sterling. Okay, sure. I think uh, both of them have uh, like 90% of the answer. Okay. Right, okay, last question. Last question. Uh, the ground down shaping technique with nickel titanium files. What part of the canal is shaped first and uh, which kind of file design? Okay. There's a few people typing, so <laughs> hopefully they're answering. Okay. Yeah, the coronal third, uh, Dr. Francis says SV file. Uh, we have to choose a winner, Dr. Sadat, because uh, already uh, uh, Dr. McKinsey uh, uh, answered correctly, partly correctly on the on the heat treatment. I think this is a correct answer. Huh? This is a correct answer. Coronal first with canal orifice opener. Okay, okay perfect. Well, I think we have our winner. Congratulations. It goes to Dr. McKinsey. Perfect. Thank you. I'm quickly going to share my screen to the delegates. Please don't run away. Um, it's just the launch offer tonight. And then I just want to show you a video of Perfect Dental. Dr. Sida, can you see my screen? Can you see me? Dr. I think we're using connectivity. It's fine. Can you see my presentation? Uh, I can see it, uh, Tanya. Okay, perfect. So this is perfect dental in the factory and the operation and manufacturing.
So the reason I wanted to share that video with all of you tonight is just who is Perfect Dental. You'll see the name more and more. And Perfect Dental in partnership with Wright Milners have been um, cr growing substantially over the last two years in South Africa. And just to give you an idea of their manufacturing, they're currently manufacturing 45,000 a day, files a day. So if we look at their file packaging of 45 files in a pack it's about 9000 to 11000 packs of files that they produce per day so they are reputable reliable and extremely cost effective um files and file systems so for the launch tonight on the mg32 files you're looking at 379 rand for a five pack um, file. You can either get it in refills or um, same same size, five files, or you can get a sorted pack where you have your SV, your PX glide path, G1, G2 4%, G2 6%, and then, a, and then there's also a G3 4% available. That's not in the assorted pack. The assorted pack stops at G2 6%, but just for your larger canals, just take note that it is a G3 4% available. Um, the system, Dr. Abit covered very well. I just want to remind you of that 35 4% taper file that's also available. And then the TF4 reciprocating file. Um, Dr. Abit also mentioned the PX Wave, which is new to the South African market as well. It was launched uh, end of last year, but we've also got small, primary, medium, and large in the reciprocating files. And if you buy three packs at 568, you'll get your PX Wave back at no charge, which is a very nice um, deal. So that is my story, and I would like to leave with you tonight that 370, 79 Rand can change your life. So take a leap and try the file system. Um, if there's any questions or backup, you're more than welcome to contact us um, anytime. And then I would also like to thank Dr. Sidat and Dr. Mark for their time and sharing their experience with us um, this evening. I don't know if there's any more questions. Maybe I can hear the questions coming through. Um, a last check, Dr. Sidat. Uh, there's a question about the obturation. Okay. What is your current thoughts on thermafill obturators or soft core obturators? Uh, I use the thermafill. I have it in my office. It's not my uh, primary obturation technique, uh, but uh, I use it. Uh, you can use it basically when you have an extreme curvature and you cannot uh, manage your plugger for the uh, fifth uh, uh, apical part. You cannot reach the plugger for the uh, five or four millimeter for the apical part, you can go for the thermophile. Otherwise, I'm not using it uh, on uh, uh, basic uh, obturation technique. But uh, of course, you can use it. It's, a, uh, it's a, uh, a possible alternative for the more vertical technique. It's a one vertical technique. Okay. Perfect. Thank you very much, Dr. Thank you to our delegates for staying with us this evening and spending your night with us. Um, we hope to see you again. Good night, everyone. Thank you and good evening. And uh, thanks again for uh, the perfect uh, Tanya and Dr. Sadat. Thank you for hosting. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's been wonderful, Mark. Thanks. Thanks so much for sharing your knowledge with us. And we really Pleasure. hope to see, see you in person in South Africa Me too. very Me soon. Too. Hopefully. Thank you, thank you guys. Okay, ciao. Okay, bye.